Take your Bibles, join with me, John chapter number 17. Let's continue to meditate on God praying to God, the prayer of Jesus, recorded here in John chapter number 17. When I was, um, you hear a lot of stories of my, my youth, you hear me talk about my, my dad a lot of times, his prison years and, and so forth, but I don't talk as much as I probably should about his post-prison years, uh, you know, it's funny, you, you, a lot of you may think of my dad as the former criminal who became a Christian in prison, but that's not my memories of my dad. My memories of my dad is as a man of God, as, as my pastor for most of my life, as uh, he you know, led our home and led the church that we were part of for such a long time. And he's always been involved in ministry, even now in his retirement years, he's still serving faithfully in the church that he's a part of. And I have never in all of my life known anything other of my dad other than him being a man of God. From my earliest years, my memories of my dad, and as you know, I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina, not in the Blue Ridge area, but in the, the South Mountain region of North Carolina is where I grew up in the mountains. And my backyard was roughly around five square miles of woods, that was my playground. And I, I know every part of my, my backyard like the back of my hand. It's probably been 30 some years since I've been there and I could probably still wander around in those woods uh, as if it were yesterday. Uh, you know, I, I lived in those woods. But my, I, have, I have memories of my dad regularly taking, he, he had this um, sheepskin that he kept in his bedroom. And he would take this sheepskin out of his bedroom and he would, he would go off into the woods and he would hike to the, literally the backside, almost touching the next uh, neighbor's property, which a long, long ways away. Uh, so he'd hike a long ways until he got to this um, area that had some unique rocks. And in North Carolina, you, you, that's pretty common here, but you don't see that as much in North Carolina, particularly where we lived, where it was all red mud out there. And you didn't just see a lot of croppings of rocks and stuff piled up. He'd go to this place of rocks, he'd lay his um, sheepskin down on a rock, and he would pray regularly. And he always went by himself, and he would spend hours out there. And I remember my, my brother and I, he took us with him one time to go pray. And we, we sat on the rock with him, and he prayed, and he said, this is where I come regularly to pray for you. For, you know, I pray for you and your brother. My, my younger brother wasn't born at the time. He said, this is where I come to I pray, for, I pray for the two of you. And I you know, often wondered how many times in my dad's life did years later did he wonder if God heard his prayers? Because I grew up to be a wild man, total rebel, and not now, of course, <laughs> but uh, still, there's still the smidget of the rebel tucked in there. We, there's always a devil left in us, all of us. Uh, and it's the, it's the Holy Spirit and Jesus in the Bible that sanctifies us and keeps it suppressed. But I, I did. I grew up, it was a period in my life where I was an absolute rebel. And I wonder if my dad ever thought all those hours of praying for me, if it was for naught, if it was a waste of time. Well, I stand before you this morning. I can attest to you it wasn't a waste of time. Eventually, God did get a hold of my heart. He did transform me. And and I did eventually go into to ministry and serve the Lord. And I would imagine all of those prayers of my dad eventually were answered. And there's something about a father who prays for his children. And, and mothers, same thing. They love their children. In this prayer, John 17, Jesus is not the father, but he has the heart of the father. And we are his children. And the remainder of this prayer, we're going to be in verse number, nine, uh, verse number nine, where, in fact, if you would just look at it, this, the first sentence, in fact, these first four words, short sentence, I pray for them. What a wonderful transition in this prayer. Up until this point, Jesus has been praying for himself. He hasn't been asking for much. All he's been asking for is that he would be glorified with the same glory that the Father has. He has been telling the Father kind of a report card of the things that he has done on earth. But this is where the prayer of Jesus transitions, and he begins to pray for specific things. 
and all of them relate to us. There's seven things that he's going to ask from this point on to the end of the chapter. Seven petitions that he makes, seven requests that he makes. And they are all, seven of them, for you and I. They're for us. Jesus prayed for you. Now specifically, in verse number nine there, when he says, I pray for them, the them is referring to the 11 apostles. But it also applies to us because the things that he prays for the apostles are certainly the same things that he prays for us as well. And we know that because later on he'll be praying for those who believe later on, just like the apostles do. And it's the, it's the same list of things. And so here he is. He says, I pray for them. Jesus prays for his children, and you are part of his children. And he's always prayed. You know, if you, if you go all the way back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, in Luke chapter number 6, verse number 12, it says that he came to a place in those days that he went up onto the mountain and he prayed and continued all night in prayer to God. And when day was, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. From the very beginning of his disciples, he prayed all night before even choosing them. And then he prayed often and regularly after choosing them, so much so that they would see him praying all the time that they eventually asked him, teach us how to pray like that. We want to learn to pray like you pray. He prayed for his disciples from the beginning all the way now to the very last night that he'll be with them. He prays for them and he tells them, because they're sitting around this table at this point, they're listening. As he prays to the Father, he's letting them know as well, I am praying for them. Such a such an intimate moment here. And it's so important for us to realize, no matter what we are facing in our life as Christians, Jesus is praying for you. Let's not forget that the Bible says that he's, he's always at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding on our behalf. So I may not pray for my family always, but Jesus is always praying for me. Jesus is always interceding for me and for you if you're the child of God. Now, everyone that reads verse number 9, though, they come to the next statement, and it, it draws out of them anger or confusion because he says, I pray for them, I do not pray for the world. And Im immediately we begin to scratch our head, and, and we think, why would a loving God not pray for all of the world equally? Why is he just praying for these? Why is he just praying for this select small group? Why does he not just pray for everybody? That, that's what he should be doing. He should be praying for all of the world. And he makes it very clear. He says, I do not pray for the world. In fact, three times in this prayer, he tells us of things that he does not pray for, which is interesting to me because we, we come to John 17, we think about what Jesus prayed for. Sometimes we ignore what he said that he does not pray for. And there's, a, there's some good theological lessons to learn from that, to glean from that as well. He says, I do not pray for the world. Now, this doesn't mean that he doesn't love the world. Let's not erase John 3, 16 from the Bible. For God so loved the world. God does love the world. That, that love is a common grace. This is what theologians refer to it as. It is a common grace. It reigns on the just and the unjust. God is kind to those who are unkind to him. God continues to allow sinners to breathe. Isn't that a wonderful thing, that he doesn't just annihilate his enemies immediately, all the time? There wouldn't be anybody left on earth. So there's a common grace, there's a common mercy that God shares to all people. There, there is a universal love that God gives to all people. He does call all people to repentance, the Bible tells us. In the Old Testament, it reminds us that God is grieved when sinners die. He finds no joy in the death of sinners. And so there is a common grace, there is a common love. He, he calls all to come to repentance and faith to him. This is, this is, as I mentioned, what theologians refer to as a common grace, but that's not the focus of this prayer. He is zeroing in on his children, those who are and have been from eternity past and will be into eternity future, his and he's praying for them. So he says, I do not 
pray for the world. And then he gives two reasons why. So if you're wondering, why would he not just pray for all of the world? Well, he gives us two reasons. First is not everyone belongs to Jesus. This is what he says at the end of verse number nine when he says, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. I don't pray for all the world, but I pray for those who are yours. I pray for the ones to whom you have given me. And they were given to him in eternity past. We, we talked about that at the beginning of this prayer. In verse number 10, he says, all are, all are mine, or all mine are yours, and yours are mine. If there was ever, as we come across these over and over and over again in the Gospel of John, this is once again Jesus revealing the, the deity that he has. He is co-equal with the Father. What man on earth, what man in general would say, all mine are yours and yours are mine? What man has ever said that everything that belongs to God is also mine? Everything God owns, I own. And everything that I own, God owns, because we're one and the same. We, we just see this emerging. Some of you didn't know these truths when you first started coming to the Cross Church, and we've been systematically going through the Gospel of John, and little by little it's just getting smacked in the face over and over and over again. Jesus and God are the same. Jesus and the Father are the same. Jesus and God are the same. It's just, it, you, you really can't get through any of these chapters without that emerging somewhere in the conversation, which is also one of John's focuses, one of the reasons he wrote this letter, to remind us again and again and again that Jesus and God are not two separate people. They are one and the same. Jesus is the God-man. He is God manifested. He is, as the Old Testament referred to him, as Emmanuel, God with us. And so Jesus says, all that is mine is yours, and all that is yours is mine. And those individuals whom you have sovereignly elected and predestined from eternity past, those are yours, and so therefore they're mine too. They're given to me by you. So not everyone belongs to Jesus, but those who are the elect are his, and he prays for them. Another reason that he gives is, the second reason is that not all of the world will glorify him. Not all of the world will glorify him. Look at the end of verse number 10. He says, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. I am going to leave this world, and so therefore there's no longer going to be me physically present in the world, bringing glory to Father, glory to the Father in heaven. And in my absence, while I am no longer on the earth, these individuals will be on the earth, and they will be bringing glory to you in heaven. We can't look to Jesus in Jerusalem or in Galilee today. I wish, I wish Jesus were there right now. There's some struggles going on in the, in the Middle East, and it's going to continue to grow. We talk about this pretty regularly in our Thursday night studies. It, it's, it's getting, it is going to, and it, if not already, it is getting out of hand, and I believe prophetically it will continue. I, I think there's much scripture that speaks of the current events that we're watching unfold before our eyes right now. I'd love to see Jesus there, but he's not there. He is in heaven. He is there in his spirit. He is there with all those who are followers of Christ. With all of his children, he is there. This is how God manifests himself in the world today. He manifests himself in the world today through you. They see God through you. They witness the love of God through you sharing the love of God. They, they see the words and hear the words of God through the words that you speak. You are the manifestation now of God on earth. And so he says, they will glorify me. Not everyone's going to glorify Jesus. Not everyone is going to glorify the Father. Why would he pray for those that are going to ruin his name, his reputation? Why would he pray for those that are not going to magnify and glorify him? And, and some of you, you might make the argument, well, you know, I don't know, that doesn't set well with me. What about what Jesus said in, on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 44? Jesus said, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Pray for your enemies, he says. Pray for those that are evil. Well, let me remind you, Jesus did do that as well. On the cross, while he's hanging on the cross, the very last prayer that Jesus prayed was this. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Jesus did pray for the wicked. Jesus did pray for the sinners. And once again, the, the focus of this prayer is not for them. It is for his children. It is for his church. But not even, 
beyond that. You are not God. You do not know the heart of everyone. You do not know the future of everyone. He knows exactly who to pray for and how to pray for them because he knows their beginning, he knows their middle, and he knows their end. He knows everything about them. And he knows who are his children, and he also knows who will be his children. I don't know that. So I pray for my enemies. Because I don't know if the, the enemy will always be the enemy. My, the, the enemy might become a child of God someday. So I pray for everyone. I, I, I pour out my heart that God would bring repentance and grace and salvation to everyone because I don't know everyone. And I don't know the future of everyone, but God does. And he can pray a little bit different than us because he knows those things. He is omnipotent and he has omniscience in all things. And so he says, I don't pray for the world. I pray for those that you have given me out of the world because they are mine and because only they will bring glory to me. So for those who are God's children, he prays for them. You say, well, what does he pray for them? He prays seven things. You know me. I can't cover seven points in one sermon. That's an impossible task. So we're only going to cover a few this morning, and I'll reserve the rest for later. Maybe we'll get through four. But let me give them to you in case you're not here next week. Seven things that Jesus prays for his children. Number one, that God's perseverance would keep us. Number two, that God's unity would be in us. Number three, that God's joy would fill us. Number four, that God's word would sanctify us. Number five, that God's gospel would be shared by us. Number six, that God's glory would be seen by us. And number seven, that God's love would dwell in us. These are the things that Jesus prays for you. And as I meditated on them a little bit more this morning, I'm convinced that these are also what we should be praying for one another as well that these things that are most dear to the heart of Jesus would be dear in our heart too. So let's look at that first one there, God's, that God's perseverance would keep us. Look at verse number 11 once again. Middle of verse number 11, he begins to pray, Holy Father, I should pause there for a moment. That phrase is found nowhere else in the Bible. You would think that it would exist somewhere else in the Bible, but it doesn't. That is the only time that phrase is used in all of Scripture, Holy Father. And by the way, it lays the, it lays the foundation upon which every request will be modeled after. Notice everything that I presented just a moment ago there begins with God, God's perseverance, God's unity, God's joy, God's word, God's gospel, God's glory, God's love. Everything begins with God. And this is the premise of Jesus' prayer. It is the the holy, righteous, pure God that all of what makes up His nature, His character, all of who He is, that it would become also what we are, that we would manifest God on earth, that we would become holy like God on earth. And so He says, Holy Father, keep them, or keep through Your name, those whom you have given me. Look at verse number 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that scripture might be fulfilled. Which, by the way, a lot of times people wonder about Jesus chose, he, he prayed all night long, and then he chose 12 disciples. And one of them ended up being a traitor. One of them ended up being a devil. And some people might think, well, doggone it, Jesus made a mistake. That, that looks so bad on him. He messed up. He, uh, he, he, uh, he prayed all night, and he, he tried his best, but he, he picked somebody that was a rotten apple. And that's just simply not the case. He picked 11 disciples. He picked 11 apostles, and he picked one because that one was the one meant to fulfill Scripture. And he picked him for that reason. Judas betraying Jesus was not an accident. That was foretold by multiple Old Testament prophets. They even, they even told how many pieces of silver that he would betray Jesus by. They even talked about the field that he would uh, commit suicide in. They even talked about what the title of that field was. They, they talked about all kinds of aspects of 
They, they, they said that he would be a friend of Jesus. And the, the Old Testament prophets revealed all kinds of things about Judas the traitor. Jesus knew this. So Jesus chose the man who was destined to be the traitor against the Messiah. And he chose him for that, which is exactly what this says. He says, I haven't lost any of their children. I haven't lost any of those that you have predestined to keep, except for the son of perdition, which that's a title given to Satan, son of destruction, a son that is destined to damnation. He says, I haven't lost any of them except that one, and only that one because that was part of Scripture's plan. That was what was predetermined, and it needed to be fulfilled. Look at verse number 15. Verse 15, Jesus prays and says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. That's another thing he doesn't pray for. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. I really, I, I really do not want to be here anymore. I heard someone, we had a, an elderly lady in our church. I heard about this yesterday. So she flatlined at the hospital, and she kind of, uh, she didn't talk, you know, she hasn't told too many people about this. I probably shouldn't even say this publicly, but I am. Oh, well. She, um, <laughs> she's at home. She's not listening right now. <laughs> I get away. I can always ask for forgiveness later. She said, uh, during that time of flatlining, she had this sense that God asked her, do you want to live or do you want to come to heaven? And she didn't respond to him. And the answer, obviously, was that God allowed her to, to come out of it. But I was, you know, after I heard that, I thought to myself, who in their right mind would say, I want to live? Like, what kind of, like, no, I want, I want heaven, like, right now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait 40 more years, 50. I don't want to wait. I want to go right now. I want heaven. Well, I want to bypass all of this. I don't like waking up tired and achy every morning. I don't like all the responsibilities and all of the struggles of life. I don't want that. I want heaven, now and forever. That's what I want. But it's not what Jesus wants. And he doesn't pray that we would be removed. I'm sure Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't want to go into the fire, but that's not what Jesus wanted. He, he wanted them to be in the fire, and he would be with them in the fire. I'm sure Daniel did not want to spend the night in the lion's den, but that's what Jesus wanted, and so Jesus spent the night with him in the lion's den. There are all kinds of times in our life and situations in our life that we do not want to be here, and we do not want to go through what we're going through, but that is what Jesus wants. And his promise to us is that he will be with us. He will not leave us and abandon us. And so he, he says, I, I, I don't pray that you'll take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. That's the prayer, verse number 15, that, that you would sustain them, that you would empower them. He says in verse number 16 that they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. What does he mean by that phrase? His prayer is that we would be kept by the Father in such a way that the world would recognize that we are not them. And we don't walk like them, talk like them, act like them, live like them, feel like them, think like them. We are not them. We are the children of God, not the children of the devil. We have the heart of God, the nature of God within us. We are of heaven. We are just simply pilgrims passing through waiting for that glorious day when we get to go to our heavenly home. And you say, how does this happen? How does he keep us? How does he protect us? Well, the, the key is in a phrase there. If you go back to verse number 11, at the end of it, he says, keep through your name. That's how we're kept. We are kept through his name, through the name of God. In verse number 12, he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. So he mentions this again. This is how Jesus kept the disciples from falling. He kept them in God's name. And this is how we are currently kept. We are kept by God's name or through God's name. You say, what does that mean? I hear, I hear um, churches all the time talk about the name of Jesus, the name of God. And sometimes I feel like maybe they don't quite understand what that means or what that's referring to. This is a he Hebrew idiom, and it, it, mean, it typically means power. Keep through your power through your authority, through your ability. It is, there is no way I will be kept righteous, pure, and holy on this earth through my own strength, through my own power, through my own ability, through my own initiatives. 
It has to be God in me. I have to abandon all human efforts and abilities and strengths and powers and rely entirely on the power of God. It has to be He who spiritually is within me. Or as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I but He who lives in me. It is the power of Him who is in me. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5, Peter said, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. He's talking about us. We are kept by the power of God. And this is what Jesus is praying to the Father. Keep them. While I was with them, my power kept them. Now that I'm apart from them, your power keep them. This could also be alluding to the power of the Holy Spirit that presides with us. It is God who is with us at all times because of the Holy Spirit. The power of God resides in us because the Holy Spirit abides in us. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 13 there's this model prayer that Jesus prays. He tells his disciples, pray like this. You're familiar with it. But in that prayer, he says this, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, that was the model prayer of which Jesus told his disciples, pray like this. And if if you overlap that with what Jesus is actually praying here in verse 11, 12, 15, and 16, you see the same thing. He's praying that they would be kept from the evil one. How? Why? Through what means? Through the kingdom, through the power, through the glory. The kingdom refers to the authority of God. The power is just that. It's the power. It's it's the very ability of which God gives to perform anything. And the glory is the purpose. It is the, the reason, the goal, the mission, so to speak, for everything. So he says, this is how... You pray, and this is exactly what I'm praying, and if you're going to be kept in this world from falling, then it's going to be through the power of God in heaven. Now, you might say, well, Jesus prayed this, but I see Christians all the time falling and failing. Every day all around us, we see Christians failing. Does that mean that Jesus' prayers are failing? Does that mean that Jesus' prayers are not being heard? Once again, I had mentioned earlier that my dad prayed for me, but for years I was a wicked, wretched person. That doesn't mean that my dad's prayers failed. It just means that it wasn't yet time for God to answer them. It was later on. Some of you parents are still praying for your children, and you're waiting for God to answer. And it's all in God's timing. But it doesn't mean that you quit praying. This is why Paul said later on to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing means don't give up. I have an uncle. I've been praying for my uncles as long as I can remember. Lord, save him. Lord, change him. Lord, you know, redeem this this lost life. Uh, To this day, uh, there is no change. Does that mean that all these decades have passed and God hasn't answered my prayer to save my uncle, so uh, God's not listening, I'll just give up? No, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. I don't know God's timetable. If the if, the, if the, the robber, if the thief can be saved on the cross beside Jesus at the very last seconds of his life, then I'll continue to pray for my uncle until there is no life. I'll pray without ceasing because I never know what God's timetable is. And so Jesus here, I want you to very quickly here, just very briefly, go to Luke 22. Luke 22, keep your place there in John 17. I think this will be good for you to see. In Luke 22, Jesus tells Peter, you're going to fail me. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to do things that are wrong. And in Luke 22, in verse number 32, Jesus says to Peter, I love this phrase, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Look at that. He hasn't even fallen yet. He hasn't even messed up yet. And Jesus is always, he's already saying, because Jesus knows everything, he knows the future, Jesus is already telling Peter, when you return, when you come back to me, strengthen your brethren. And now why why is he saying that to you? Because because I prayed for you. Man, I so appreciate, 
I so appreciate the fact that so many of you pray for me regularly, for the pastors on staff here. I appreciate that you pray for us regularly. But it will never compare to Jesus praying for me. It's good. It is so, you know, don't, I'm not, not downplaying it. But to think that Jesus will say the same thing to you and me, but I have prayed for you. You're all going to mess up at some point. You're all going to fall. You're all going to fail. There's going to be times in your life when you're going to do things that you regret. But I hope that the Holy Spirit will whisper in your ear on the backside of that, the words of Jesus, but I have prayed for you. It's time to return back. Some of you sitting in this room, you may have already, you're, you may be living in the moment of failure. Uh, you know, I've been speaking to a couple recently who have been living in failure and, and only in recent weeks have come to the terms of the fact that they, they need to return back. It's never too late, never too late to do the right thing. And besides that, if you're God's child, He'll chasten you and he'll, he'll lead you and he'll guide you and he'll convict you because he'll bring you back. That's what he does. He loves you. And he says, you will fail. You will fall. You will disappoint me. But I have prayed for you. And when you return, when you return. We'll return back to John 17. So God prays or Jesus prays to the Father that God's perseverance would keep us. Number two, Jesus prays that God's unity would be in us, that God's unity would be in us. Look at verse number 11 once again. At the end of verse number 11, he says, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. This is God's prayer for, I would say corporately the church, that we would be unified. As, as individuals, sure, but that would be unified with him. But corporately as a church, he wants us to be unified. Go to verse number 21. Verse 21, he says, and, Or that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. This is the prayer of unity. That just as Jesus is unified with the Father, that the church would be unified with the Father and with one another. Look at verse number 22. He says, In the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Look at verse 23. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So he's three times here we see in this prayer, he's asking, that, he's asking the Father that they would be one, that they would be united together. That they would be, that there'd be full unity in the church. Unfortunately, we don't see that a lot, do we? Here we are, 2,000 years into the, the church age, and there are so many denominations. I, I don't even, I've lost count of how many denominations there are. Do you know, just within the, the circles of Baptists, there are over 900 denominations worldwide. I don't know how Baptists could disagree with each other so much, but they do. And as we see, Lutherans do and Presbyterians do and everybody. That we, there is so much disunity represented in the Christian world. And it's, it's heartbreaking because this is one of the things that Jesus focuses on so much in this prayer is that unify them, unify them. Don't let them be split up. Don't let there be division because this is how Satan works. It's divide and conquer, divide and conquer, divide and conquer. Get them fighting over everything. Get them fighting over the little nitpicky things and the preferential things and the non-doctrinal doctrinal issues. Get them fighting over all that stuff so, that they'll, so they'll not be unified in the mission. They'll not be unified in the goal. So they'll not be unified in the purpose of the church. And so Jesus says, Lord, please unify them. And, and he's not just asking that they would be unified. He's asking that they'd be unified. Verse number 11, once again, he says that they may be one as we are. That they be as, as unified as we are, as God the Father and God the Son is. Verse 21, he ends it by saying that they also may be one in us. Unified in us. 
verse number 23, he says, or in verse number 22, he says, that they may be one just as we are one. That, that if you see one Christian, you've seen them all because they're all the same. They all believe the same. They all do the same. They all live the same. And, and they, they live as the Word of God presents. They, they live as God on earth. Now, what I just said, you, you look at me like, that's, <laughs> that's alien. That, is that not what he's praying for, though? Now, why is that? Well, in verse 23, he says that the world may know that you have sent me. There is no greater testimony of the spiritual vitality of the gospel than a unified church. It proves that God is real. It proves that the gospel is genuine. Now, why is that? Well, God is not in disunity with God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit never argue with each other. Jesus and God the Father, they never have disagreements over doctrine. They never have disagreements over soteriological issues or estological issues or any doctrinal issues. They are always completely and totally unified with one another. That should be the model of the church. The church should be so in tune with the Scriptures, so in tune with the, the knowledge of the Scriptures that we're completely and totally unified. We, we should be so submissive to the Holy Spirit that we are always unified as God the Father is unified. When the church is unified, it proves that it is something from God and not just simply an institution from man. Why do you see so much divisions in churches? Well, they become institutions. Why do you see so many denominations splitting? They become human institutions. The Spirit of God is not guiding them. The Spirit of God is not unifying them. When, when the church is permeating with the Spirit of God, if you read Acts chapter number 2, you see a, a Spirit-led church. Everybody in the early church there on that first day, they're, they're Spirit-fed, or they're Spirit-filled, rather. And what does it say? Well, it says that they had all things in common. They shared with one another, and they were submissive to one another, and they loved one another, and they praised God together, and they studied the Word of God together, and they did all things that were right. They, were, they had all things in common. They became unified. Well, why was that? That was because the, the Holy Spirit was driving them, and the Word of God was at the center of everything that they did. That's what Jesus is praying for, and I pray to God that we would see that emerge again today. So, so Jesus prayed that God's perseverance would keep us. Jesus prayed that God's unity would be with us. Third, Jesus prayed that God's joy would fill us. Look at verse number 13. Jesus said, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, but they, uh, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. This is the third time on this night, because we're still in the upper room, this is the third time in this one setting where Jesus is talking to his disciples about the joy of heaven. His prayer to the disciples is this, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I pulled off the shelf in my office this week a book. I believe it, was, I believe it, was, it came out in the 80s. I could be wrong. I forgot exactly when it was published. I haven't read it in years, and I thought, it's such a good book. It's such a classic. It's a Christian classic. I thought, I need to read it again because I was recommending someone else to read it. And I thought, well, maybe I need to freshen myself up on it again. And it's a book by John Piper called Desiring God. The subtitle is Meditations of a Christian Hedonist. <laughs> Sounds kind of strange. But he lays this biblical argument, and it is solid biblical argument, that from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end of the Bible... God is very concerned about your joy, your happiness, your fulfillment. Jesus came that not only that you would have life, but you'd have it more abundantly. God wants you to feel at peace. God wants you to be fulfilled. God wants you to be at, at, at oneness with Him. This is, a, this is a theme all throughout Scriptures. And what Jesus is saying here to his disciples is, my prayer to God is that they may have, and notice the word, my joy, 
fulfilled in themselves. God doesn't want you to just have temporary happiness. He doesn't want you to have financial security just for this life. He doesn't want you just to have contentment with the whatever job or occupation that you have currently. He doesn't want you just to feel satisfied in your relationships that you have or the marriage that you are part of in this life. God is more concerned about your entire eternal well-being. He wants you to have the joy of heaven, not just something that is based off of circumstances, not, not something that is material-driven, not something that comes and goes with the wind, whether or not the, the circumstances of life are matching up with the, the desires and the perceived needs of your heart. It's far beyond that. It's on a much deeper level, piercing beyond what your mental intellect desires and gets to the very depth of your heart, fulfilling the very essence of why you even exist. God says, I want you to have heaven's joy, heaven's peace, heaven's happiness, an eternal joy. He's praying for it. John 15 and verse number 11, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. That's the heart of God. I don't, I've never understood why the non-Christian world, they look at Christians and they think, oh, you, you know, you just, you, you worship and serve this angry God that has all these rules and he just wants you to be his slave and do what he tells you to do and, and, and you know, remove all the joy and happiness of life and all the fun of life and like, you, you just have no clue what the heart of God is. Like, you literally just don't even understand what this is all about, do you? You are the children of God. You are the creation of God. And He wants you to be fulfilled. He wants you to be happy in Him. This is, you say, well, how much? So much that God was willing to die for you. That's how much. It's so important to God, your eternal well-being, your eternal happiness, that He is willing to die for you. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. This is how we come to a full state of joy and happiness. Well, I'd love to dive into this fourth one here but we're just not going to make it this morning. And even as I say that, I'm tempted to change my mind, but I'm not. Because it's such a good one and I don't want to rush through it. Jesus prays and begins praying in verse number 14 that God's word would sanctify us. I hope God's word has been sanctifying you already this morning. But it's such an important one that I don't need to run through it. We need to tiptoe through it and glean from it because there's nothing you'll discover in your life more important than the sanctifying work of God's Word. Most of the ills and issues of your life are immediately erased when you begin to live in God's Word. When you begin to take a hold of all of what God has gifted you through His truth. And so I don't want to rush through that. We'll come back to that next week. But I will give you a challenge as we bring this service to a close. The challenge is this. This is one I shared in a meeting that I had this, this week. I've noticed, and I've noticed for a long time with Christians, I, I don't think Christians develop healthy patterns in their life. They, they read their Bible when the conditions are right. They spend time in prayer when the feelings are there. But that's not a healthy pattern to your Christian life. If you want to have a healthy pattern to your Christian life, develop routines. Develop a routine that incorporates daily meditation in God's Word. Now, I didn't say reading God's Word. Daily meditation in God's Word. A lot of people develop rituals in their life where they go, I'm going to read five chapters of the Bible every day. And so they, they do for a while, but they may not feel the, the benefits of it because they're, they're just simply getting up as early as they can and they speed read through five chapters and boom, 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 knock it all off, done. And they have a little prayer and they move about their, their life. That, that does almost nothing. Every once in a while, the Holy Spirit will captivate you or, or drive you into a certain verse or something, but it's far and few in between. No, 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 that's not what God wants. 
What God wants is for you to sit down in front of his truth and think about it. Slowly think about what's being said. What does it mean? What is God saying? How am I supposed to apply this to my life? What did this mean to those that read it the first time? If you develop, well, I can't put any weight on that. If you develop a routine, a pattern to your life of daily, you know, some people are night owls, and you're, you're more awake and more alert at night. If that's you, then set aside some time at night to meditate on God's Word. Some of you are morning birds. I'm a little of both. So sometimes I, you know, I'll stay up at 2 or 3 in the morning sometimes, and sometimes I get up at 2 or 3 in the morning. It depends on what day of the week. It, you know, I'm, I'm a very mixed bag of stuff. And, and I'm pretty much alert at, at both ends of, of the clock. I, I sleep whenever I want. And, and I do. I, I, sometimes that's in the middle of the day. So I have a weird pattern to my life. But there are, and, and it's not as much about when you do something as it is about you choosing to daily do something. And so here's the challenge. Make and challenge yourself to read and meditate on God's Word every day of your life. Every single day. Don't skip a day. Now, I, I realize sometimes you'll be in the hospital, <laughs> other times coming up. I, I get that. What I'm saying is you're, you're making a commitment to yourself every day. I'm going to let God's Word be my food spiritually. Just as I eat every day, I'm going to read God's Word every day, and then make it a habit to pray every day. Jesus prayed every day. Jesus prayed every day, every day. If Jesus needed to pray every day, you need to pray all day, every day, because none of us are like Jesus, and if Jesus needed to pray every day, then I know you need to pray every day. Not only do you need to pray every day, you need to pray all day long, because we're not Jesus, and so we need the power of God. We need the presence of God with us. You develop a pattern, a healthy pattern, and know yourself. Know, know your weaknesses, know your strengths, know the things that makes you tick, and, and develop a pattern around that, a healthy pattern that you can repeat every single week for the rest of your life. If you will do that, I promise you, and I don't make promises lightly, but I promise you, your life will never be the same. And that I can promise you. 